Good morning, everyone. This is our first session, the real, real body of this big conference. We have heard uh, many uh, interesting uh, speech from the keynote speakers, and it's very, I am very eager to learn more about these things. And the first session is, uh, uh, we, uh, this title is Envisaging Interest Rate Normalization, Advanced in Emerging, economy, Emerging Market Economies. And <clears throat> in we have two papers. They do not, in appearance, uh, uh, appear to be directly related to this issue, but uh, they are also uh, related to this uh, normalization uh, process problem. And uh, to save time, I won't give detailed uh, introduction to speakers. We have two speakers, uh, two papers, and two discussants. They are eminent uh, scholars in this area. And let me first go to our first speaker. Uh, by, by the way, there's a slight change in the format. Uh, I will give first uh, uh, change opportunity to first speaker. Then uh, 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 there will be uh, discussions, discussion first. And then we'll move to second paper. So there's a slight change in presentation. Okay, uh, let me introduce uh, the first speaker, Professor Marco Passetto. Uh, he is uh, at the University College in London, and where he is a professor of macroeconomics, and he also serves a research advisor for Federal Reserve Board of Chicago. And he will present a paper titled Ford Guidance. It's about Ford Guidance, whether it's communication or commitment or both. And this is very interesting. And when we have this uh, so-called normalization process, uh, how the central bank will convey its message uh, would be very important. So, Professor Pesetto, you have 20 minutes. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Thanks a lot for uh, the opportunity to speak here. That's, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, let me mention that this reflects my views and not those of the Chicago Fed or the Federal Reserve. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, forward guidance. Uh, as you're very well aware, uh, interest rates have been uh, stuck uh, essentially at zero, sometimes a little negative, sometimes a little positive, but pretty much at zero. Uh, for quite a while uh, throughout many countries uh, in uh, the developed world. Um, and forward guidance has been one of the alternative instruments. And uh, these uh, have been, uh, so I'm going to talk about forward guidance as statements that are about future policy. Um, and uh, um, so what's important here is uh, it's, the, it's about policy, uh, not necessarily about the state of the economy, because we've had statements about the state of the economy for a long time. So some of uh, uh, my colleagues in Chicago have uh, uh, proposed a taxonomy for, uh, uh, for our guidance. They've made a distinction between uh, what they call the Odyssean forward guidance, um, where Odyssean comes from the story of Ulysses and the Sirens, where Ulysses tied himself to the mast to, um, to um, prevent himself from throwing himself into the uh, sea when he heard the uh, um, siren song. So it's about commitment. Uh, the ability of saying something and then uh, um, then sticking to it because maybe it's embarrassing to change uh, um, your mind afterwards. And uh, they contrasted that with Delphic for our guidance where that comes from the Oracle of Delphi. So the, uh, the Fed, the central bank, knows something. The public doesn't. And the central bank comes in and tells people it's superior information. So that's about um, revealing information. The distinction is potentially important. Because uh, if forward guidance is about commitment, there's a better chance that it's uh, uh, expansionary. You know, you're committing yourself to keep rates low for an extended period of time um, when you would uh, uh, instead, uh, say, raise rates for inflation pressures. If it's Delphic, it might very well be contractionary. Um, if the um, announcement is we're going to keep rates low for an extended period of time because we think the economy is in worse shape than you think it is, then that might lead to downward revisions. Um, so this distinction is potentially important. Of course, the world is not black and white, and uh, that's part of what I'm going to talk about today, is that the two things may very well interact. 
So my starting point is going to be um, fairly simple. So photo guidance, um, in, in the way, say, it's been done by the Fed, is a set of statements that does not directly constrain central bank actions, does not directly change future decision processes, or uh, affect payoffs. So the FOMC committee is still met, uh, meeting eight times a year. Um, they didn't, the photo guidance was not of the form, uh, uh, we think rates should stay low for two years, and therefore we're not going to meet again for two years. That would have been a commitment type of, uh, a clear commitment. No, it's, uh, there's an expectation that things are going to be done in a, a certain way, but if they, could, uh, if they wanted to, they could just take a simple vote and disregard what happened in the past. Um, so uh, in, uh, in economic theory, there's a technical term for this, which is uh, cheap talk. Now, I want to stress this is a, a technical term. It's not the uh, cheap talk in the common uh, sense of, uh, uh, of the term. Um, so uh, here, talk is going to be cheap because it does not directly affect payoffs, uh, but it will actually carry consequences in, uh, in some cases, and, uh, and that's, otherwise there would be no role for forward guidance. So, so the goal of what I'm going to talk about today is think about when, uh, what are the environments in which forward guidance uh, uh, has a role to play, um, and how does it work, and in particular, what uh, does it communicate? So what is it best suited uh, to communicate? Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to set up um, a very simple monetary policy game uh, where I'm going to study repeated interaction between a policymaker that I'm uh, going to call either government or the central bank, but you should think that it's just one policymaker, and, uh, and the public. And there will be things like reputation, embarrassment, these terms that um, were present, uh, say, in, uh, in my colleague's um, um, paper. And uh, we're going to study when, uh, um, when this has a role to play. And then what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, study a sequence of uh, economies. Obviously, there are going to be variations of, on the main uh, model where gradually cheap talk in the form of forward guidance is going to emerge. So at the beginning, there will be environments where forward guidance does not uh, have a role to play. Um, and then uh, by the end, uh, there will be a role for forward guidance. So I'm going to study this in uh, the Barrow Gordon model. Um, that's because it's a, a very well-known model. It's relatively simple. Um, from my perspective, it's going to be clear who chooses what and when. I'm going to add a few tweaks to, that make the relevant points. But hopefully, um, I will convey to you the notion that this is uh, a, a much more general. Uh, what, what I'm uh, doing here is much more generally applicable than to that model. So. Here's a, um, a simple description of uh, my economy. Um, there's going to be um, two main shocks, one to potential output that I'm going to label Y star, and one to the inflation target, pi star. There are sunspots that are there for technical reasons. You can forget about them. Um, here's the evolution of the economy. At time zero, nature draws the shocks. Nobody observes this. There's an entire sequence of shocks. And then uh, gradually, information unfolds over time. And so the government and the private sector will uh, receive uh, information according to uh, some processes, GT and FT. So those describe what um, the government, um, G, and the private sector, F, know over time. Um, and uh, so that's going to be a time T. And then at that point, the government may choose to send messages, some a general message MT out of um, some set uh, that is allowed, uh, that is abstract for now. Um, after observing their information and the messages, uh, households set their expectations about output and inflation. Um, and then the government comes in and sets uh, uh, its policy, which here is going to be directly inflation, like in the Barrow Gordon model. Um, based on uh, household expectations and government policy, output is going to be realized. And at that point, um, that's again a technical assumption uh, that I'm not going to talk about today unless you ask me. Um, the households are going to observe what the government observes uh, at the beginning of the period. Uh, so I'm going to bring back symmetric information. And it's not important. It's at the end of this period. It could be in 10 periods. But um, the reasons for that, um, I will only uh, uh, talk about if you ask me. <clears throat> 
Okay, so here's how output is going to be determined. Output is going to be, first, uh, let me focus on the first two terms. It's a linear combination of what potential output is and what people expect. So there's going to be some strategic complementarity across people. If you expect output to ha be high, that's an excellent incentive for me to work, and that's going to lead me uh, to work harder and so uh, to produce more output as well. Um, so this is uh, slightly different from Barrow Gordon, but in Barrow Gordon, um, theta is equal to 1, which means uh, that output is just driven by potential output. I'll, I'll show you in a second, well, in a little bit, why uh, I'm, I'm making that tweak. There will be one environment where that's going to be relevant. And then the last term is the usual um, Phillips curve component. Uh, so if the government somehow manages to set inflation higher than uh, inflation expectations, that has a stimulating effect on output. And vice versa, if inflation is below what's expected, that's contraction. Um, what are the objectives? So for the government, the objective is uh, to uh, minimize square deviations of output not from potential, but from potential plus something. So that's, again, as in uh, Barrow Gordon, the government somehow wants to overstimulate the economy, um, and, uh, um, and that's captured by this term K. Um, and that's going to be the source of the conflict. It's going to be the reason uh, why um, policymaking is going to be interesting, and also the reason why sending messages is going to be somewhat com potentially complicated. Without that term, the government could simply tell people uh, what it observes, and uh, uh, there would be uh, no reason uh, for any misreporting. But because the government would like to uh, send output above potential, there's potentially a role for, uh, uh, for misreporting, a temptation to misreport at least. Um, on the inflation front, the government has an inflation target, and, uh, um, and it wants to minimize deviations from it. And the paper um, discusses a, a slightly more general case where there's interaction between inflation and uh, uh, potential output, but I, I can't uh, talk about that um, here. Households are going to be extremely simple. Um, they're going to try to guess uh, what the government is doing right, and so uh, they're going to use all of their information, which is uh, contained in the set FT, plus the message that the government sends, MT, uh, to set their expectations for output and inflation. Now, the set of equilibria for this economy is very big. Um, it's big because uh, uh, this is a, a dynamic game, and so there's a, a big role for uh, uh, the government uh, to uh, have or not have credibility. Um, so there are trigger type uh, uh, strategy equilibria where if the government um, played by, quote unquote, played by the rules in the past, so either said low inflation or uh, reported things truthfully, then its credibility is preserved and um, it. Um, people will believe that announcements in the, uh, in the future again, and uh, they will expect low inflation again in the future. Um, and uh, uh, faced with a trigger that if the government somehow deviated from that, it would lose this credibility. Or there are equilibrium in which that credibility is never established. Um, so in general, my statements in the paper, uh, although here I'm, for the purpose of the talk, I'm going to focus on, uh, tend to focus on the best equilibrium. Um, my statements in the paper are about uh, how the set of equilibria changes. Um, and many things can happen, but sometimes uh, uh, bringing in for organic in means that you're expanding the set in a good direction, so more good things can happen, although all the bad things remain there. That's, uh, there are technical uh, tools to uh, compute these equilibria, and uh, uh, those uh, are the ones that I'm using in the paper. So let me start from a benchmark. Let's suppose there's no private information um, whatsoever. So the people and the government know exactly the same thing. There might be uncertainty, but they face a common uncertainty. Then the first result in the paper is uh, that the set of equilibrium payoffs is the same with or without messages. So this is a situation in which policy statements by the central bank might carry consequences, so uh, I want to stress, I have not ruled out the possibility that they might carry uh, consequences, they might cause embarrassment. There are certainly equilibria where that's the case, where you make a statement and uh, you, uh, your credibility is at stake and you lose uh, your credibility if you deviate from it. 
but it turns out there are equivalent equilibria in which messages are not sent, and the credibility is based not on the statements, but on directly on the actions. And so I think this is fairly intuitive. If we all know the same information, um, and uh, um, there's no question about uh, the government somehow um, knowing a little more uh, or saying a little more, then uh, uh, anything that can be done uh, by um, making statements about policy can be done directly by the people expecting what policy ought to be. So if we agree, for instance, on what is good policy, um, then uh, we should just expect the government, the central bank, to undertake that good policy, and we're going to base the credibility on whether they go through or not. Um, and so here, this is an environment where actions speak louder than words, and uh, for our guidance is not a necessary tool. It might emerge, but it's not a necessary tool. Let me give you an environment with private information. Um, so the first um, type of private information I'm going to introduce is one uh, uh, where uh, um, the target, inflation, uh, the target uh, for inflation, pi star t, is known to everybody, so no asymmetric information there. But the government knows something more about potential output at the beginning of the period. Um, and uh, so the question is, does forward guidance emerge now? Well, so here's uh, uh, what would be the optimal policy if the government had access to commitment. And there are conditions uh, on parameter values uh, such that this is going to be what happens uh, in the best equilibrium. So under commitment, what the government should do is uh, announce truthfully um, its observation about potential output. So here I'm assuming that the government actually knows potential output perfectly. You don't have to. Uh, the government should really announce what it knows about potential output and set inflation to the target. Under commitment, there's no role, of course, for misreporting, um, and there's no systematic way of e e exploiting um, the, any trade-off to bias things. So this is an environment in which making statements by the policymaker uh, strictly improves welfare. If you cannot make that announcement about what you know about potential output, that's going to create more variance in the economy. It's going to be undesirable. Um, and, uh, um, but the question is, uh, so in that sense, it's Delphic. But is this for guidance? I would argue this is about um, central bank transparency, not for guidance. What you have to report is uh, the under information about the underlying uh, economy, not the policy that you end up taking. In fact, the example that I just laid out is particularly stark because there's nothing to report about policy. Policy is supposed to set inflation at the target, and that's it, independently of what happens of potential output. Now, the paper goes through a more general case where uh, policy might interact with the information about the underlying state of the economy, which is going to be, in general, the case. Um, but even then, um, reporting policy in this environment would be an indirect way of uh, uh, reporting what the people really need to know, which is the information about the underlying state of the economy uh, that the government has and people don't. So great to have transparency in this environment, but it's still not a case for forward guidance, which brings me to the next uh, and final uh, environment that I'm going to talk about. Let me flip things around now and say that uh, there's symmetric information about potential output. That's not important. I mean, the two things could interact, but I want to focus now on asymmetric information on the inflation target. So suppose the central bank has its views about the world that lead it uh, to have a, a particular view of uh, uh, what um, inflation um, should be, um, and uh, it has superior information about that compared to households. I think that's a pretty reasonable assumption to make. Um, now, in this environment, if the uh, public knows the policy that is, will be undertaken, then they have all the information they need to make their decisions. Um, they don't really need to know the target directly. What they need to know is what the central bank is going to be doing. And so not surprisingly, um, a policy that, um, I mean, a, mess uh, a messaging policy that announces uh, uh, here the inflation target, but really the, um, the inflation that is going to be undertaken by the central bank, uh, 
is going to be um, desirable. So here under commitment, what the central bank would do is announce truthfully its inflation target and then set inflation to that target. If you don't have commitment power, then uh, uh, you, would, uh, um, you could potentially announce uh, ranges uh, of where inflation is going to be, um, and, but it, you would carry through uh, with, uh, uh, with an inflation that is in that range. So this is an environment where, uh, again, um, with asymmetric information, uh, cheap talk is essential, but it's directly about policy. In the paper, I go through another uh, um, example, which is slightly more complicated, so I couldn't fit it in 20 minutes, where I think is, uh, which I think is even more relevant and interesting, which is a case in which the asymmetric information is about central bank beliefs rather than uh, uh, preferences. Which brings me uh, now to, to my conclusion. Let me step back from the model and uh, think about what this tells us about um, the real world. I think what this model teaches me is that forward guidance has a role when it's communicating what the central bank believes and what the central bank um, is, uh, um, um, and therefore what the central bank thinks uh, that should be done. Communicating insights into the decision process of the central bank. It's general statement of agreement, disagreement within the committee. Um, in particular, it can uh, uh, um, be useful to talk about the models that policymakers believe in, because I think that's the part that is uh, the most relevant uh, piece of asymmetric information is uh, what are the models that um, policymakers uh, use in, their, in making their um, choices about what's optimal and not. So, for instance, we know that for organics, um, um in terms of extended periods of zero interest rates comes out of the models of Krugman, Egerson, and Woodford. Those are not universally accepted, and even if you don't accept them, it's still valuable to you to know that the central bank does, and so the central bank should reveal that information. Of course, it's much simpler to say um, what, that we're going to keep rates low for an extended period of time in the statement rather than saying we believe in Krugman, Eggerson, and Woodford because uh, thankfully the press is no longer here, but the press would have a hard time if you tell them we believe in uh, uh, Krugman, Woodford, and Eggerson they probably will understand if you say you're going to keep rates low for an extended period of time. Um, let me, I'm out of time, so let me just say um, that um, there's complementarity between credibility and, uh, um, and Elphic forward guidance. So this is not a paper against Odyssean forward guidance. Uh, it's a paper that says asymmetric information is important. Once you have it, um, Credibility is important uh, in order to be able to report to, uh, things truthfully, and in terms, the fact that you're reporting things might actually enhance uh, your ability to achieve uh, good outcomes in terms of uh, uh, credibility to, say, stick to a low inflation target or other things. Thank you. Uh, let me now turn to our discussant, Sir PD. You have uh, 10 minutes. He is from Bank of Thailand. Okay, good morning. So I'd like to, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the Bank of Korea for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, being a central banker and this being a central bank conference, I will emphasize more how uh, this, the, analysis, the analysis in this paper translates into the practice of forward guidance you know, in the real world. So um, let me just start with a quick overview of a classification scheme of forward guidance into three different types. Um, the first one, you can think of forward guidance as inputs into policy setting. And this could be like um, statements about economic outlook or the balance of risk. The second type are what I call determinants of policy setting. And basically, this has to do with talking about the reaction function of the central bank. This could be the target variables that you intend to, uh, to pursue, the values of those target variables, as well as, as the weights, uh, the rel relative weights between those, those targets. And the third type of uh, communication uh, you could call intended policy setting, and this could be time contingent, state contingent, or non-contingent. I, I guess uh, the clearest example of the latter is the Swiss National Bank forward guidance on um, its policy to set a floor on the Swiss exchange rate relative to the euro. Um, that's an example I think that, that, that I'll come back to a bit later. And as you move uh, from 
type 1 to type 3, I think the spirit of the forward guidance changes from one of clarifying to guiding and to promising. And so this is a scheme that I think, uh, where I distinguish between Delphic and Odyssean forward guidance, I would put it in terms of how much you go towards promising something as opposed to just uh, making uh, transparency statements. And one of the comments I had on the, on the paper was actually semantics, because in terms of um, the, the way uh, Marco characterized Odyssean forward guidance and Delphic, it was tied to the information structure of the, of the, of, of the model, where uh, Odyssean forward guidance is analyzed only under symmetric information, whereby construction, uh, I guess, communication doesn't have much of a role. Um, whereas Delphic is analyzed only under the case of, uh, of asymmetric information. Um, to me, it would be more interesting to actually characterize the, the difference between Delphic and Odyssean as uh, uh, how the degree of promise varies along a continuum uh, and analyze both under the assumption of asymmetric information. So one of the key principles that comes out of the paper, which I agree, is that central banks should communicate whatever information advantage that they have directly. So this re reminds me of the um, public finance literature where you should you know, tax wherever the distortion or the externality should be. And I think that's a good principle for central bank communication in general. Um, but in terms of foreign guidance, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's an issue with, with, uh, with semantics uh, that I think analyzing this kind of communication under commitment, um, and it, it may not be translate as much into, into the, the practice so much because it's, it's very difficult to commit in practice. Uh, uh, one of the areas where I had some question was that there are, you know, as in mo all models, um, we have simplifications. But in this case, there's some missing nuances which I think are very important. Firstly, because Odyssean forward guidance is modeled pretty much as a trigger strategy. Either the central bank has always played by the rule and never deviated and can do, uh, uh, keep doing that, or if it has deviated once, then its, its reputation is it's, uh, completely gone forever. Uh, which is quite stark. And if you look at the, the history of, uh, say, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, uh, they have all updated their forward guidance from time to time, from um, time contingent to state contingent to non-contingent, and uh, with, with, not, well, with, with very little loss in credibility, in my view. So um, I think the history of play maybe has too much weight in the model right now when it's and analyzed as a trigger strategy uh, for the audition forward guidance. The other element is that um, it neglects some key dimensions of forward guidance, uh, two in particular. First is about the horizon. I think if, when you make statements about what you intend to set policy tomorrow, that's going to be highly credible. But if you make statements about what interest rate is going to be in five years' time, it's going to, it's going to be much less credible. So that degree, this, this dimension of... of um, yeah, it is missing in, in, in the analysis. Uh, the second element, as we all know, conditionality is very important. Uh, the paper defines forward guidance as direct statements about the future path of their policy tool. So if I take that literally, um, the best way to do forward guidance would be to publish a path of your interest rate, and which we know many central banks do. And here's an example of the pioneer, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, have been publishing its interest rate projections, and this shows you the actual versus the projected policy path going. Um, and you know, if you look at this picture, if anyone looks at this picture and, and don't understand that these rate forecasts are conditional, then either you're very naive or a slow learner. So the conditionality element, I don't know how to put it into the model, but it, it's very important. Um, in terms of, of the practice of, of, of forward guidance. Um, I have another example from the Fed, which has a similar um, point, but I'll, I'll skip that. Um, this, the other element of the paper, which I think is critical, is the information structure assumption. And here, uh, not only in this paper, but in general, most models assume that the public knows the reaction function of the central bank explicitly knows all the elements um, and the weights. Uh, but when it comes to assessing you know, communication, I think that assumption is questionable 
because personally, I don't think uh, the market ever really know the true form of the central bank reaction function. And central bank's reaction functions can and do vary over time. And I think forward guidance, especially the Odyssean type, is precisely about these temporary deviations of uh, central bank's reaction functions from the normal norm. So in some sense, I think the paper uh, uh, downplays the complexity of communicating the reaction function in practice somewhat. And uh, for an example, you know, so this is the, the, the reaction function of the central bank that is taken to be known by everybody in the model. And I compared to uh, an example from the real world for the Bank of England in 2013 issued a guidance um, that runs 360 words. I'm not going to read it, but this is basically the reaction function of the central bank at that time. And it basically says something like, you know, if A, B, and C happens, I don't know, if A, B, and C doesn't happen, we will do C, D, E, and F uh, subject to some nonlinear non transformation that we will think of in real time. So it's very hard to, uh, to, to see how the markets will actually interpret this uh, so precisely as, as uh, is assumed in, in, in the models. Um, I think I'll skip this because... Uh, and more important, another point about the information structure is that there's an, uh, it neglects the assumption of private information asymmetry. Uh, it's assumed that central banks and the private sector may have different information, but it doesn't analyze the case where private individuals themselves may have different intimations um, or heterogeneous beliefs among themselves. Um, Michael acknowledges this in footnote eight, so it, it, it's not something he does, he's not aware of, but I'm, I'm just saying it's a, it's a very important uh, um, dimension because different interpretation of the same signals by market participants can have uh, substantial effects on the outcome. And there's a recent paper by Andrade and co-authors that actually analyzed this. And precisely, uh, Marco mentioned also in his talk that, um, you know, if, if the promise to keep interest rates, or the statement, not the statement to keep interest rates low is interpreted as bad news about the economy in the future, that may be contractionary. Uh, if the statement is interpreted as an exogenous easing of a reaction function, then that may be uh, stimulatory. Um, so that's, that's, uh, th that distinction is important. And more importantly, I think when you take into account private information asymmetry, uh, then public signals can cause agents to ignore the diversity of their own information. And I'm referring here to the global games literature a little bit. When you, when you, you, know, you can think of the public signal as a bulldozer that actually just kind of throws away all the diversity of private sector discussion. And that can lead to some um, bad outcomes. And here's an example from the paper by Andrade that I mentioned earlier, where it shows that the, the dispersion of uh, expected interest, interest rate paths for the U.S. going forward. And you can see as the Fed moved from its uh, forward guidance, open date, fixed date, state contingent, the dispersion of, of uh, interest rate forecasts has just come down quite substantially. And this is points to a, a big risk of forward guidance. Uh, firstly, it may be misinterpreted. No matter how hard you try to signal the conditionality in forward guidance, markets will try to make it time contingent because they trade time contingent instruments. So there's a risk that they ignore all the conditionality and, and just interpret in a way that it's uh, not intended. And by emphasizing this forward guidance, I think you chop off the probability distribution of some asset price, in particular here, the interest rate. And this is clear from this picture. You're chopping off like the upper distribution of, of the interest rate. And this leads to threshold effects, uh, which, you know, we had this obsession with liftoff. Um, and there's an excess sensitivity to certain information, like the unemployment rate, that becomes a focus of all communications. And the problem is that it leads to one-sided markets and crowded trades. I think the, the huge volatility that we've seen in the bond market um, is an example of, of, of that. The, the Swiss National Bank, when it changed its forward guidance, we saw big losses, not only for the SNB, but also for, for private sectors. And the, 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 I think the greatest example was in 1997, Asian crisis. You know, if you believe the central bank will maintain the peg, you actually take unhedged foreign exchange exposure, and it, and it, it leads to, uh, to, to problems. So let me end, my time is up, um, by stepping back a little bit. I think 
uh, the paper it, it helps to understand forward guidance better and I think it's a very important contribution in that respect. Uh, but taking a step back in terms of uh, the theme of this session, um, the new normal, I think uh, looking seven, six or seven years into, into the recovery phase, I think the justification for forward guidance is a bit misplaced. I agree with Bill completely that there is a, a risk that we are overburdening market policy with, with things. Um, but more importantly, I think forward guidance is not the most important innovation for the new normal. I think the underlying uh, economic models used to analyze policy that Bill mentioned is much, much more important. Uh, if you're driving down a cliff, you know, it doesn't matter how well you communicate. Uh, I think <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's the, the second, the first order is actually how you, you know, you think the car works and where you're going. And so, so uh, my wish, or my hope is actually for the new normal. Uh, or my fear is that the new normal is going to be back to normal or more of the same that as Bill mentioned. And I, I hope maybe we have a discussion that uh, that is where we try to, to, uh, to change things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Marco, you have a five-minute rejoinder. Mm. So I want to thank uh, PT for a, a, a very good discussion. Um, I agree with much of what he said. Um, it comes down to what William uh, was saying earlier. That's, uh, uh, in theory, the theory and practice are the same thing, but in practice, the world is more complicated. Um, so there are many things like conditionality that uh, are important in practice that were not in the paper. They were not in the paper not because you cannot incorporate them. You could easily uh, put in uh, um, contingencies and so on and so forth, but uh, the paper wants to make a transparent point. Um, it's meant to be simple, um, and, uh, um, and so you want to abstract from anything that um, is not essential for, uh, for your story. And so uh, those things uh, uh, can definitely uh, be accommodated. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention um, is, uh, um, I, mean, this, I, I have a slightly different view on uh, where the new normal is going to be, and I uh, think that maybe or uh, where it ought to be, and that's maybe why this uh, uh, paper, uh, paper fits in this session. So I think that those uh, um, pictures from the Reserve Bank of uh, New Zealand um, tell us something that maybe uh, we should think more about. So even uh, once we're going to be done uh, with uh, um, five year, uh, you know, with uh, uh, with this uh, long period of uh, zero interest rates, uh, the question is, uh, um, should we? Uh, um, should uh, central banks communicate um, the, um, what their beliefs are through uh, things that look like uh, forward guidance? Uh, so um, everybody understands that uh, those uh, um, uh, projected interest rates paths are conditional. I think markets have seen enough of those pictures to understand. I think they're useful. Um, they're also useful uh, for central banks to go back and think whether they have uh, the right models or not. Having something in the public domain um, forces them to confront the models that they're using uh, more directly um, and uh, hopefully um, to think through whether, they, you know, if they're uh, proven wrong time and again. And I don't mean, obviously, any point path is going to be wrong all the time, but um, in a statistical sense, um, are, are they delivering on average, or are they systematically off? If they're systematically off, that's going to call for better models, and I think uh, for organics is going to have a role uh, to play in that as well. And I think that's all I have in terms of comments. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, this concludes our first paper. Now let us move to our second paper. Uh, Andrew Levin will uh, present, give us a presentation about Robustifying monetary policy frameworks in the normalization process and beyond. Andy is at the IMF and he will move to Dartmouth College soon. Okay, Andy, can you yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers and to the Bank of Korea. It's a really great conference. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, just please note the red ink at the bottom of the screen that nothing I say today should be taken as representing the views of the IMF. Um, unfortunately, there's a couple distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, Jonathan Ostry and uh, Dong Hae, who will be talking later, and they can represent the views of the institution. 
<laughs> well, okay. Um, uh, so actually, in many ways, I think my views are, 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 are not so far from things that Bill White said this morning. So maybe you could view this as an elaboration and sort of getting into some more specifics. But um, the idea of robustness is that we should be concerned about really bad things that can go wrong. And that just focusing on sort of how things work during normal times uh, may, may not be enough. And the problem is that we, we experienced a relatively tranquil era. Uh, observers, including Ben Bernanke, referred to it as the Great Moderation, um, where a lot of the research that was done at the time in monetary economics uh, focused on log linear models. So you uh, do a log linear approximation around the steady state, which is you know, very good for looking at dynamics in response to small shocks. Uh, people looked at quadratic objective functions, and then they looked at optimal control strategies, where if you take a log linear model and a quadratic objective, the, the strategy, the optimal strategy for the policymaker is certainly equivalent. So you can completely abstract from any notion of uncertainty or risk. Now, of course, I say researchers, but um, uh, Professor Sargent's an important exception to this in his work with, uh, with Hansen and others, uh, looking at nonlinear models and learning and uh, non-quadratic objective functions and, and, and um, robust control approaches. Uh, but, but that was the exception. Most central banks, including the one that I worked at for 20 years, this is what they did. Now, in terms of forecasting, most of the forecasters, both at public institutions and private organizations, were mostly focused on the modal outlook. Modal here means the most likely outcome, the most likely trajectory for the economy. Um, you look at something like the blue chip consensus report or the um, consensus economics surveys. Um, most of the pages of those reports are about what people see as the most likely outcome for the economy. And, it, and at um, central banks and policy institutions, uh, likewise, most of the models in use were log linear models, um, and most of the policy analysis was aimed at uh, finding what's the path of policy that's expected to be most consistent with the achieving the inflation objective over the medium term. People refer to this as flexible inflation targeting. But again, essentially focused on the modal outlook. Now, I say this was characteristic of the, of the great moderation period, but the reality, if you look at these three points, is things haven't changed that much. Um, I still, when I look at the blue chip or the consensus economics, still most of the pages are modal forecasts. Um, still, when I look at a lot of the literature, most of the models are, are log linear models in, in use at central banks. Um, again, with exceptions now, but that's the general, still tends to be the case. Um, it's still the case that most of the communications of central banks, including the Federal Reserve, is oriented toward the modal outlook over the medium run, with very little discussion or elaboration of what are the risks and uncertainties. So um, I guess a question that Bill White did not answer this morning, and I was eager for it to hear it, maybe in the general discussion he'll give us the answer. Why are central banks so resistant to paradigm shifts? That was the question he had. He literally had that question on the slide. I thought he was going to answer it. He didn't. Okay, but anyway, just from my introduction here, I think that question is, is important. So just to give you one example of this, why I think this is so urgent is because I was at the Federal Reserve in September 2008 when we went over a cliff. Now, this is the statement that the FOMC issued on Tuesday, September 16th, 2008, the day after Lehman declared bankruptcy. The day after Lehman declared bankruptcy. Okay, now, the transcripts of that meeting are now published because the FOMC publishes them with a five-year lag. All the staff materials that were presented to the FOMC are published. So I would say... I wouldn't be showing this to you if this wasn't a fair characterization, not just of the words the FMC published that afternoon, but in fact the characteristics of the discussion at the meeting and even the staff analysis that was presented to the committee. Um, it's all about modal outlook. You know, there's a sense that um, strains in financial markets and, and tight credit conditions are likely to weigh on economic growth over the next few quarters. I mean, this is speaking in September 2008. And inflation is expected to moderate later this year and next. And then there is a sentence about risk. Downside risk to growth, 
and upside risk to inflation are both of significant concern to the committee. Now, I mean, the previous discussion just mentioned, but what if, what if you're driving down a cliff? I, maybe it was down a, down a, what was the word? Not a cliff or something, or down a, a steep slope or something. So this is where we were. Okay, we were going over a cliff, but people didn't even realize it at the time. The models, the modal outlook, all of the, all of the analytical approaches were not helpful. So we can't make that mistake again. We shouldn't make that mistake again. And so if I tell you that things haven't changed enough, I mean, again, I think this is the message that Bill White was communicating this morning. Okay, so I'm going to try to capture the spirit of what I believe, I hope Professor Sargent was calling for, which is more attention to bad scenarios, worst-case scenarios. And that's what, why I'm going to call robust monetary policy frameworks. How can we design a framework that isn't just about the most likely and fine-tuning of the most likely um, policy around the most likely scenario. Okay, um, the policy framework is broad, and so this um, presentation I'm going to give you today will probably run out of time and um, uh, uh, do what I can to cover some of the key issues here. But it's the institutional design, the specification of the goals, the tools, the policy strategy and the communications, those are all encompassed by the framework. Now, I would say that the lesson we have from the global financial crisis and the aftermath of very slow recovery, which is also something that was emphasized this morning, have underscored the crucial importance of establishing robust monetary policy frameworks. Now, one way that I would define robust here, a little bit less technical than in the Hanson Sargent work, is to try to identify material risks to the economic outlook. This is a way a business person would talk, a material risk, something that we think is plausible, not something that's utterly ridiculous or, you know, safely ignored, okay? It's got to be a material risk. And here the word risk, I guess, again, might not be as technical as uh, what Bill White was referring to as risk in the sort of uh, Knightian way, Okay, but, but risk here means something bad that could happen that would have severe consequences. So the combination of the words material and the word risk here means it defines what kind of scenarios. Now, the reality is it's not that easy to identify material risks. It takes time and effort and thought to try to think outside the box. What could go wrong? In what direction? What are we missing? What, what's not in our models? Okay, how bad could it be? Okay, and then the other part of it is a contingency plan. How do you mitigate those material risks? And again, this is standard practice for good businesses. It should be standard practice at central banks. I mean, we want it to be standard practice at financial institutions. It should be standard practice at central banks as well. To identify material risks, a lot of staff effort should not be gone into refining the details of the modal outlook down to the last decimal and all the disaggregated variables. Okay, a lot more time and energy and effort and thinking, research, analysis needs to go into identifying material risks and then developing contingency plans. What can we do to mitigate those risks? What can we do to prepare for them? Sometimes they're going to be unavoidable if they happen, but at least let's be prepared. How would this have worked in 2008? Well, I think that realistically, and again, we could talk about this more during the coffee break, we, we had good reason to think in August 2007 that we might, might be heading toward a global financial crisis with 5% probability, let's say, at that point. The Federal Reserve and other central banks could have started talking about currency swap arrangements. We could have started talking about QE and forward guidance and what kinds of tools we would use, how, what or emergency liquidity framework. All of those sort of things could have started to be developed. Some internally, maybe not all made public yet, Okay, but that's the sort of thing that I think is urgent to do. So again, what we call robust policy frameworks. Okay, so in the rest of my talk, which now I think I have about 10 minutes left, yeah, um, I'm going to try to go into some specifics, both in governance and in the clarification of the policy strategy. Um, now, Barry Eichengreen and I talked last night. I mean, he said, well, you can go too far in terms of transparency, and, and I think that's an important discussion to have. Um, I think one reason for transparency is that we're talking about democratic societies where it's, it's um, par part of, 
You cannot expect a government agency to have power and not to be accountable to the public. You just can't in a democracy. And so part of the reason for transparency is you have to maintain the trust of the public. And so that's probably, to me, is the most, the most fundamental reason for transparency that we often abstract from in our models, because our models rarely even have political economy elements in them. Okay. But I think there's actually a very strong rationale for transparency in terms of robust monetary policy frameworks that also hasn't been captured, although um, Marco actually said it in one, some of his very last sentences when he was standing up here a few minutes ago. He said, you know, if the central bank puts out its model, then academics can critique it. And we think that's a good thing. We think that's important. If we want to make sure to try to minimize the risk that things go wrong um, and to prepare for if they do, then that's the support of discussion that ought to happen, should happen, must happen. Okay, so what are the concrete things? First, the Montreal Policy Committee should provide timely and detailed information to explain the rationale for its policy decisions. Timely here means not after five years. Frankly, that's too long. It doesn't have to be after five minutes either. There's somewhere in between. And so let's leave that as an as a open question here that might depend on the institution and the country and so forth. Okay. Detailed means not just a few broad words in a 500-word statement or something, okay, or a few charts, but enough detail for outsiders to really understand what were the analysis that was leading to the, to the Mate Policy Committee's decision. And again, why? The rationale is robustness. So those outside analysts can ask questions and identify potential flaws or blind spots in the thinking of the central bank. Absolutely crucial. The head of the Monetary Policy Committee should hold a press conference after every regularly scheduled meeting. That's a chance for the press to ask questions so they understand this. Um, now, the ECB and the Bank of Japan do this. The Federal Reserve doesn't, for reasons I still do not understand. It's not that costly to have a press conference. It's part of the accountability of the central bank, and it should happen. Okay. All of the staff materials that are provided to the Monetary Policy Committee should be published within a reasonable time frame. Now, again, what is reasonable here? Not five minutes, not five years, somewhere in between. Um, I think that the ECB is remarkable in this sense because four times a year they publish the staff forecast in a substantial amount of detail. I don't know why other central banks don't follow that practice. I would strongly recommend that they do. And finally here in the list is the quarterly monetary policy report that would provide a detailed explanation for the policymakers' thinking, not just the staff, but the policymakers' thinking. Um, and as I'll talk about in a minute, that explanation shouldn't just be about the consensus decision. It also should be include discussion of the diversity of views. So that leads me to the next thing about robustness. We talked about outside-the-box thinking. Paradigm shifts was the phrase that Bill White used. Okay, if you're going to do effective risk management in any organization, whether it's a business, a financial institution, or a central bank, you have to have outside-the-box thinking and creative problem solving, which means you need smart people from a wide range of backgrounds and perspectives. And this is hard. I think it doesn't come naturally to central banks. Central banks tend to be very conservative and inertial. I would say that's a fair characterization, at least over decades, maybe not over you know, years. Um, okay, well, that has to start at the top. And so I think the selection process for members of the Monetary Policy co uh, Committee or Council should ensure the policymakers themselves have a diverse set of backgrounds and perspectives. Now, what does this mean in practice? Again, we could talk about the details. I'm sure it depends on the country and the time period and so forth. But I would say that as much as I love having a monetary policy committee where everyone on it has PhDs from MIT and Chicago, you know, Princeton, Stanford, and um, I don't want to leave anyone out, okay, but hopefully I covered it. You know, has strengths, but it also has limitations because it means there's a real risk that that committee isn't thinking far enough outside the box and becomes too resistant to paradigm shifts. So I think that having members of the committee who come from other backgrounds is very important. There should be individual accountability. This is not a corporate board where the committee makes a decision behind closed doors and then just pretends that they're all on board with it. Okay, it's crucial to the public the confidence in the institution to know that a wide range of views was taken seriously in reaching the decisions. After all, these decisions affect jobs and livelihoods 
and savings of millions of people out in the economy. And so I think they deserve to know that this was very carefully considered. Don't hide the diversity. Make it a key part and element of the discussion. How are we doing for time? Four minutes, okay. Um, another element of governance is terms of office. Now, again, there's a balance here, and you know the balance may differ in different contexts, okay. But I think the terms of Monte Policy Committee members need to be long enough to protect the committee from short-term political pressures. Okay, that's a risk. There's a risk that you can have a political environment where the committee suddenly comes under a political pressure, and you want to mitigate that risk to the extent possible. So the terms of the members should be long enough so there can't be an abrupt shift in the composition of the committee. The committee's composition will evolve over time. On the other hand, I think there's a strong case, people have recognized it more recently, that the terms of office shouldn't be too long either. That's the resistance to paradigm shifts problem, okay? That people who've been around a long time, and actually Bill White may be exceptional to this, like we could debate about that over lunch. Um, but you know, whatever you've been doing things for, what did you say, 45 years? You know, that it's really hard. I think Tom Sargent is someone who illustrates this, the ability to maintain flexibility and creativity over 40 years is, is very difficult for most of us, okay? Um, and so that the, the, the terms of office should reflect that. I would say the state of the art, and the Bank of Canada illustrates this, is probably a non-renewable term of something like seven years. Maybe as short as five, maybe as long as 10, non-renewable and overlapping. So again, that protects against the political pressures. The last element of governance is external reviews. And again, I think this should follow naturally from what I've already said. The MPC has to open itself up to letting outside experts come in and examine everything and try to identify not about specific decisions, but about processes and strategy and communications. Are you missing something? Are there potential problems that could be addressed and mitigated? And those reviews should be conducted on a regular basis not initiated by elected officials when they're upset about something the central bank did. That's not a good idea. It should be a regular schedule every year or two. And the results of the review should be disseminated to the public, presented to the government. And then the MPC should have an action plan how it's going to address those issues. This is just, this is good business practice. I think it's, it's good practice for banks. I don't see why it shouldn't become standard practice for central banks. Okay, now I don't have time, I'm running out of time here just to talk briefly about monetary policy strategy and communications. Maybe my slides could be circulated to all of you if you're interested in more of these details. I guess I'll just say briefly that the monetary policy committee should do stress tests for monetary policy in the same way that it's asking the banks and financial institutions to do stress tests for their own um, institutions. The central bank itself should do stress tests for monetary policy, which means, again, identify material risks, formulate those in terms of scenarios, and formulate contingency plans of how you would address those risks. And then the last thing I'll just talk about briefly is simple rules. This is a little bit use, a different use of the word um, robust than what the Hanson Sargent literature did, but, but Taylor's idea about simple benchmark rules is that they're not the optimal policy in a single model, but they provide reasonably good performance across a whole range of models that reduces the risk that we're sort of fine-tuned too much to one particular view. And that seems very important and sensible to me, and so it should become part of the, uh, the discussion. Now, again, just to reiterate things that are already said here, what about persistent forecast errors? Look at these. This is for GDP growth year after year after year for the five years in a row. I think this was mentioned before. But likewise for inflation, every year the FOMC participants are expecting that, oh, just give us a couple more years, inflation will be back on track. And in fact, the HP filter trend is downward. And the latest reading we have is uh, 1.2 on the core inflation for the U.S. Um, so again, there's a risk, at least a risk, a material risk, that things are heading in the wrong direction. And that needs to be taken seriously. What are the contingency plans that the FMC would roll out to deal with that? Okay, so again, I think benchmark rules, like not necessarily the Taylor rule, but Taylor style rules should become part of central bank practice. Um, here's an example how, of one that I've developed 
um, some analysis I should say I've developed with Dave Blenchflower, who's a colleague I'll be joining at Dartmouth in three weeks. We put out an NBR working paper um, of how we look at the current context in the United States using something called the balanced approach rule, which is actually a rule that um, John Taylor studied very carefully in the late 90s, um, showed that it has some nice properties, a little bit different than the original Taylor rule, but similar in spirit. And Janet Yellen actually talked about when she was vice chair. And what you notice here is that given the CBO's assessment of the employment gap and the current level of the inflation gap, the balanced approach rule says that the federal funds rate target right now should be close to zero. And again, slightly above, slightly below, essentially close to zero. And if the Federal Reserve started to use this as a benchmark to explain the rationale for its policies, and people understood that, then they would understand that if inflation continues heading downward, then the horizon over which it's likely that the Fed will in fact lift off is going to be postponed, maybe postponed for a long time. And on the other hand, if inflation starts picking up again and the employment gap continues to shrink because job growth is strong, um, then you know, uh, the, the target federal funds rate under the benchmark rule will rise above zero. And that would help, I believe, avoid things like taper tantrums because it would enable people to better anticipate the reaction function, the systematic policy of the central bank. Okay, so in conclusion, again, we need to develop robust monetary policy frameworks to identify and mitigate material risks, especially in an environment of, of very severe model uncertainty. And that can be done through governance, transparency, accountability, alternative scenarios, contingency plans, simple benchmark rules. Um, I really like Marco's paper. Look forward to talking about it more. I think that sort of research um, can help us clarify uh, some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, we can discuss more in the general session. Now let's turn to Professor Jin Il Kim of Korea University. He will discuss uh, Andy's paper. Ten minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Lee. Okay, first I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, including me in this uh, very prestigious conference. As you can tell even from the first slide, Andy was my friend, colleague, and actually a supervisor at the Federal Reserve Board. You can tell from the fonts of this word template. And the theme of the conference, global interest in normalization and monetary policy challenges. And then if I summarize Andy's paper it, briefly, it's, I think it's Andy's a very nice and very rich answer to the theme of this conference, especially on two aspects. And he talked more of the central bank governors, so I'll be brief on that. And he has is a very rushed in the second part, which is long run goal and police strategy. And then I'll be spend a little more time on that side. <coughs> and then rather than commenting on his answer or on these two aspects, I am pushing Andy's answer or answer or the answer kit a little further to the case of Bank of Korea for two mm -hmm. reasons. First, this conference is hosted by the Bank of Korea, and so I'm sure that a lot of staff members are here, so they can, <clears throat> I hope they can, if I were, say, the say external review, or what would I do? But rather, as well as that, I think there are a lot of uh, other uh, the staff from other central banks, and then not especially EME countries, and then this is the part, EME party is the one organizer asked me to specifically talk about. So the first part is the central bank governors. And then he talked about the duration of terms and selection process. And in the Bank of Korea, there are seven committee members and two ex-official members, including the governor who spoke this morning, and five, say, appointed MPC members. And their term is four years. And in the case of Korea right now, four of the five appointed members, their term expiring early next year. So in, for his criteria of, of overlapping terms, I think that is a problem. It's very well known. It's even questioned by the congressman to when the governor was in, in the Congress. And as recognized, there are technical and legal issues, but I think it's the first of the importance in, say, robustifying Korean monetary policy framework, so they should be receive a lot of attention both by the Bank of Korea and the, the political arena like Congress in Korea. And then the third point, bullet point, is the individual accountability. 
And in that sense, as far as I experienced in Korea in the last five years since I retired from, resigned from the Federal Reserve Board, I think the level in terms of over time would, has increased quite significantly and relative to other central banks, in, individual accountability level is, is, is very high. So there are dissents and then the level of discussion revealed to the public at the end of the, the meeting is, is, is much on the final level than other central banks I have experienced. And then in terms of uh, timely and transparent communications, maybe it's a different culture, but there are more open uh, communication like the press conference at the end of every MPC meeting by the governor. And then as an academic, even I could attend one meeting when they re renew their the projection every quarter. So in April, I had a chance to attend, so I was kind of happily surprised that I could attend, and also the level of discussion between the staff and the press. And then on the last point of regular scheduled external review, I, I have participated in various activities in Bank of Korea, but I don't think there's any kind of formal external review, and that has not been discussed as much and also that all should be discussed not only by the Bank of Korea, but also by, say, Congress and then the administration, but that's for the, for the topic. So let me spend the remaining time on four points and the put on long-run goals and policy strategy. Again, at the case for the case of Bank of Korea. So for the first, the medium-term inflation objective, Bank of Korea is putting their goal every three years Actually, this fall, they are revisiting their inflation goal and how to set the goals for 2016, 17, and 18. And I put a slide from, this is the 2012 annual report published in March of 2013. So I'm sure around March of next year, we will see 2015 annual report on which, it's kind of too fine, but they publicly communicate with uh, the public on how they set the new goals and it will be the focus of the press late this uh, fall and next year. So in that sense, their uh, communication would be well, I mean, first in, in the press. But I think they are facing some challenges. That challenge is very similar to the PC inflation forecast and they put. And I am summarizing what happened in the last three years with six charts. The first one is the Bank of Korea's CPI projection in, say, July of 2012. And their inflation is a little bit over two, and then they are projecting a pickup or a return to their target. And in six months, in 2013, January, this is their projection. And then, like the case of the Federal Reserve Board, it has been postponing or pushing forward. And then, this is where we are. Now, of course, they changed it in, in April, but I just put in for January and July. So they need, they are facing an even more difficult challenge in terms of how you communicate what has happened in the past and what we will do. And, but of course, it's not only in Korea, as Andy put it, I'm putting the same picture in the same footing for PC inflation for the United States, and that's the FOM's projection in the summary of economic projections. Of course, in 2012, inflation was high. 2011 and 12, inflation was high because of the oil price. But after that, if I put in every six months for the FOMC projection, it's pushing forward, and especially early this year, it's pushed forward farther. Andy put three pictures of these six lines, so it's much more striking on Andy's. So this is facing not only for Korea, but also for the world. And then we are facing of how to communicate this situation. And the most striking feature of that is what PT was referring to. And the dots are FOMC median forecast of what will happen, what is likely to happen or what should happen by this 20, at the end of 2015, 16, and 17 in terms of the federal funds rate. And the two lines are what is extracted from Fed for futures. And there's huge gap. First, level-wise, there is a gap. And the more importantly, the growth rate or the derivative is even, even more striking. 
and the FOMC is expecting a, uh, an increase every, every year, five or six times from this slope, while the market is expecting less than four, like three times from this slope. And that is a kind of good data point, if I say, for Marco to understand what are the, the, the merits or the, the ground to fill up in terms of uh, communication. And this is what we are, we are now, but I am thinking in a more medium to, term. And more important one is this medium, medium target level for the long run Fed, federal funds rate. Say, and then if we agree that the FOMC's commitment to 2% inflation is strong, then this exactly reflects the decrease of the long run real interest rates from 4.25 to 3.75 and decrease of 50 basis points over two or three year horizon, that's pretty dramatic and rare. I don't know how rare it is in your last 45 year experience, which is pretty rare in my short experience. And then this is a, could be a basis or reason for this, probably one of the most famous debates for secular stagnation between these two contrasting figures, right? So I can see someone doing this and the other way, and then People should take a stance, and for the central bank, like the Bank of Korea, for example. Personally, I think the aging is important, on which I have worked on it myself. But let me move on to the second one, which is how to communicate resource lack and financial imbalances, as well as, say, the interest rate. On that front, I, am, I have copied this, but the most recent, of, of, recently available multi-policy report from September, which was translated in English. And on the right, the highlighted parts are kind of uh, put it here as to emphasize that in the case of Korea and probably the same for other EME countries, the global economy comes before the domestic economy. I think that's different from advanced economic countries. And also, if you look at number two parts, in many countries, I don't know if it's a strength or weakness, but the real economy say output and unemployment comes before inflation. That's 2A, but 2B is price inflation, and 2C and 2D then comes the financial markets and foreign exchange markets. And then that importance on the foreign exchange rate is very important. And on the last point on scenario analysis and contingency plans, I have prepared the financial stability report which Bank of Korea started to publish in since 2003. And for the panel discussion later uh, tomorrow, say, I think when Korea, Bank of Korea, when I first did see, saw the number 2003, I could see of two different ways. Many of you, especially from the Western world, would think of it, oh, it's 2008 minus five. But others, especially from people from Asia, would think, oh, it's 1998 plus five. So the way they did five years before GFC or five years after Asian financial crisis. And that kind of background is history dependency in EME countries for the discussion of the normalization process. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Andy, you can rejoin the five minutes. You can sit there, Roy. I uh, really appreciate Janil's remarks, especially because um, for some family reasons, I wasn't able to get him the slides until very late. Um, I think we're basically still on the same page, even though we haven't been working in the same building for the last five years. So that's really good news. So why don't I just leave the time and we can have more time for general discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, uh, Dr. Che, can you also uh, give us all the materials later? Yeah, okay. Now let me open the floor for general discussion. Uh, we have two interesting papers and lively discussions. And please raise your question, uh, raise your hand, and identify yourself. And please be brief with your question. Okay. I'm Andy Atkinson from UCLA. Um, uh, my economics department is about to go through an external review. Uh, it will be an episode for people who don't like us to pound on us. 
Um, but I was thinking about your analogy to corporations, my, why it might not work for central banks. Uh, there's a variety of people who would argue that central monetary policy acts through engineering wealth transfers. Or more broadly, there's a diversity of interests. Some people want monetary policy to go one way and some people want it to go another. And so it can be a very political issue. And so then the external review process simply becomes a, a process, runs the risk of just introducing all those politics into the determination of policy. And so I, I, I'm wondering whether there's kind of the pendulum's going too far in terms of I introducing transparency and review in, in your proposal. Okay, Andy. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Well, you cannot come like Terry. Okay, you're first. <clears throat> I, I wanted to elaborate my point about maybe central banks can, can go too far in the direction of, of transparency with an example, which is the, uh, the Bank of England's new procedures. They decided a couple of months ago to move to a system where they will have a full um, seven days between when uh, members of the Monetary Policy Committee make their statements and, and basically decide on what to do and when they finally announce the decision and, and the governor has a press conference and the uh, long lag is designed to give them time to prepare the transcript so they can be um, transparent about what the debate within the committee was. The unfortunate fact being that a lot of things can change over, over seven days rendering the debate and, and possibly the decision irrelevant uh, circumstances. Okay. Okay, please. Uh, Dr. Kang. Uh, may, may I ask the speakers about the implications of your presentations on the um, publishing uh, future policy path um, and like the uh, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, Central Bank of the Sweden and Norway. Some central banks, they began to publish their future path, policy path, while the other central banks hesitant, seems hesitant to publish their future path or policy rate. What do you think these two different approaches of central banks? Okay. Okay, please. I have a question to Marco. I mean, when the forward guidance was played out in the United States, there was a big debate whether it should be forward guidance for a certain time period or it should be tied to a particular target like the unemployment rate. Does your analysis help us to understand which way to go on this dimension as well? Okay. Okay, Dr. Che. Uh, I have a yeah a couple of uh, comments. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for nice presentations and uh, comments. Uh, we are in the face of uh, global interest rate normalization, and uh, uh, we talked about uh, uh, uncertainty uh, type. Maybe a nice uncertainty uh, is relevant at this juncture. So if we look forward in the face of uh, uh, huge uncertainty, uh, what type of uh, forward uh, guidance, uh, say uh, Delphic or Odyssean, would be uh, more effective uh, in the face of you know, uh, our uh, forecast mis and mistakes? Uh, as Gini has illustrated, uh, we uh, have seen uh, under prediction uh, or over prediction of, you know, uh, uh, Central bank forecast in terms of inflation forecast and uh, uh, upper growth. So, how uh, can we uh, deal with uh, uh, uncertainty and how can we uh, communicate uh, with the public? Uh, so, uh, this point is uh, related to Marco's uh, presentation. And uh, uh, the second one uh, is associated with uh, 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 Andy's uh, uh, presentation. So uh, for emerging market economies, central banks are faced with a more complicated uh, communication problem in the sense that we need to uh, uh, watch or you know, uh, hear 
other central banks, major you know, advanced economies, uh, central banks' uh, uh, policy positions. And then we uh, need to respond uh, in terms of policy stance. So uh, how then uh, can we communicate uh, to the public? So in this case, um, how can we uh, sequence uh, our you know, uh, policy uh, positioning? So uh, uh, I, w I would like to hear uh, your views. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, you have a question? I'd like to ask the, uh, the panel for their comments on the, the interaction between transparency and financial markets. Um, for example, in, in 2004, uh, the Fed started this process of raising interest rates by a measured amount every, uh, every meeting. And what was meant by measured was 25 basis points. And when the market sort of started to realize that, effectively what they said was that all the uncertainty has gone out of my investment decisions. And if the uncertainty is gone, then you just go for it. And this was a positive invitation to leverage and helped create the severity of the problem that we ultimately wound up with in 2007. Is that a, a fair assessment or does the panel say, no, it's an unfair assessment? Okay. Uh, any more? No, let's on. Oh, okay, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, thank you very much for the nice discussions on transparency and uh, and uh, accountability uh, of um, of uh, monetary policy committees. But my question is: uh, so we we are setting up everywhere macroprudential boards, uh, which to some extent uh, have to take uh, you know decisions on on a different you know different domain, but which have also a very important time dimension, so when do you put in place a counter-cyclical capital, uh, when do you increase your, your, your capital adequacy ratios, the counter-cyclical capital buffer, you have a, a, a lag in the decision as well. So um, is there, shouldn't we be thinking a lot more also about the way decisions are made in the context of these macro prudential boards and with the same set of, of ideas that you have been pushing in the context of monetary policy, uh, would they also apply to these to these boards or not? Okay, thank you. Uh, now let's turn to our the speakers. Uh, Mark, you, you go first. So uh, the first question uh, on on my side was: uh, Should we publish paths? Um, I think, um, in my opinion, it's a uh, it's a good idea. Um, it's uh, useful to know. What are the beliefs uh, uh, that underpin monetary policy? Um, and uh, um, they, re they reveal information. They also uh, are going to be ways of uh, um, deciding whether models would need to be changed. And once things are, you know, th this could be done internally, but uh, once things are in the public domain, uh, there's a bigger track record uh, uh, that you have to stand for. Um, if it's internal, you can always dismiss things uh, and say, well, we changed the model, we tweak things here and there. Um, Marcos had a question about uh, what uh, my model would have to say about time versus state contingent. So under commitment, um, policy should um, be of definitely of the state contingent form. Um, in general, if you have a model with uncertainty, you want to respond to uncertainty, not to the lapse of time. Um, when credibility is a concern, though, um, time might also matter. Um, it's easier to um, stake your credibility on a policy that you're going to be undertake for a couple of years than it is to, um, say, take it to the extreme to say we're going to keep rates at zero for 20 years. That would be harder to sustain. And so there's a bit of element of, uh, of both that potentially would be there. Um, you had a question about um, the um, thinking forward about uh, Delphi versus Odyssean, and so I think the I, I, the I think I view uh, the two as uh, interacting with each other. I don't view them as uh, either or. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention in terms of uh, these pictures that we've seen uh, in terms of inflation mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I spent a little bit of my policy time looking at inflation forecasts. 
you know, inf inflation mistakes happen. It's true they've been a little bit on one sided for the last five years. I don't think that's uh, necessarily a fail of models that you get five years of uh, uh, one side. Um, certainly, eventually, they shouldn't be too correlated with, uh, over time. So if you observe that this is a, 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 a persistent problem, then that's going to change. But, you know, five years in a row is, doesn't mean that things uh, are necessarily uh, correlated over time. Um, streaks happen. Um, in terms of uh, interactions between uh, transparency and uh, uh, financial markets, I think there is a danger there. Um, the, um, it's important for policymakers to convey the information that um, there's uncertainty and uh, that they're not going to be ruled by financial markets. Um, been to various discussions in places where the um, idea that we don't want to upset markets has come up. Um, I think we certainly don't want to upset markets, but we should also convey the information we're going to respond to news, uh, that policy making is going to respond to news, and that's going to have effects on financial markets, both up and down. And so that's certainly something that, uh, to do. And certainly, as um, transparency and uh, for organize uh, is useful for monetary policy. I think it's useful for other types of policy, including macroprudential. Anything where you have uh, uh, technicians uh, on board uh, is useful. It would be extremely useful for fiscal policy. The problem there is uh, uh, it's much harder for politicians to give uh, for organize because they may not be there uh, to deliver. And so that's, uh, uh, but certainly giving uh, more guidance to where policy is headed uh, in, in a number of dimensions, I think, is useful. Okay, thank you. Now, Andy. Well, these are great questions. Um, let me take a stab at them. So first of all, Professor Atkinson asked about external reviews. Um, so first of all, some central banks do these, I think, very successfully. Lars Svensson has um, been a reviewer on a number of occasions. He's the sort of expert I have in mind because he has practical experience as a policymaker as well as distinguished researcher. Uh, uh, so I think that how do you avoid the politicization of this? First of all, as I said, it should be um, done on a regularly scheduled basis. Secondly, it should be done by recognized experts. Um, the Again, diversity comes in here, so you probably want to have a group of experts that represent a, uh, some range of backgrounds and, and approaches. Uh, and their results, their findings should be made public. So if it looks like uh, for somehow the, the, the review itself got hijacked, um, th then that would become apparent. And finally, the, the central bank itself would have an ability to respond to the review. Uh, so. These are routine for most other organizations. I just don't see why central banks should be viewed as so different. And again, the experience that I've seen of central banks that have had external experts come in and do reviews has been oh, that it's certainly constructive. And of course, in some cases, the central bank may ignore the results, but that's a separate problem. Uh, Professor Eichengreen raised this issue about the seven-day lag, and I think I completely agree with his assessments, which he's expressed publicly in more detail. Um, uh, so <laughs> transparency, I would have argued, actually, that what they did was, was a reduction in transparency for the reasons Professor Eichengreen said that creates a longer lag between the decision and explaining the decision in a timely way. Um, that the, the goal of trying to elaborate on diversity of views is something that, for example, with the FOMC is done through speeches of Reserve Bank presidents and interviews with the media, and the minutes come out three weeks later, and those present a, a careful discussion, a, a summary of the discussion at the meeting. So I, I don't understand why the Bank of England is following the approach that they've decided. I hope Professor Eichengreen eventually will, uh, will convince them to take a different approach. But I wouldn't call that as part of a discussion of, you know, should we be more transparent or less? That's a case where, you know, it just, um, it's, it's not, and it's not an efficient communication approach. Um, 
Uh, Professor Brunnermeyer asked about calendar dates versus conditional forward guidance, and I think I agree with Marco that forward guidance should be conditional. That's the whole point of having a Taylor-style benchmark policy rule. Uh, it's the point of having uh, uh, alternative scenarios and contingency plans. Uh, the irony to me is that the Federal Reserve this year dropped verbal characterizations of what the likely path of policy is going to be. But in practice, there's still a lot of interest in understanding that path, as there should be. And so what's happened is that members of the committee have gone further toward calendar date guidance. They're talking about, well, what's the likelihood that we're going to tighten this year, lift off this year, or not? Rather than focusing the discussion on, as appropriate, how big is the employment gap today? How big is the inflation gap? At what levels of those would the committee think that it's appropriate to start tightening policy? So um, uh, let's see. Um, Bill White asked about measure pace, and I'm totally in agreement with him. I think it was a major mistake. Uh, it, it, again, this wasn't about transparency or not transparency. It was a mistake to make a deterministic path of tightening over the course of two and a half years from 1% back up to around five in quarter point steps, linear, perfectly predictable. And the implied volatility and the realized volatility at the time were very low, and I agree that that probably contributed to uh, risks in the financial system. But that's not what, what I'm, certainly not what I argued for in my presentation. What I'm arguing for is robust policies that are state contingent and that identify material risks and think hard about alternative scenarios. Okay. Um, uh, Professor Ray asked about macroprudential boards, and I'm not an expert in macroprudential. I'm trying to learn more about it. But mostly what people tell me is that there's still not very well understood. Even Don Cohn is very forthcoming about this. How well are the tools really going to work? Is still, there's question marks around it. Um, I've heard presentations by Nellie Lang, who's at the Federal Reserve Board, with similar sort of spirit of modesty. So um, I think in, if, for the reasons I explained about the link between transparency and robustness on monetary policy, it seems like those same links are there for macroprudential. That whatever analysis is informing the macroprudential board, they should put out in public so people can ask questions about it and critique it and identify where are the missing holes and um, out-of-the-box thinking and so forth. Definitely should help. Okay, finally, um, Deputy Governor Choi asked a couple of insightful questions. I'll just take one, which was the challenge for emerging markets where their path of appropriate policy depends in part, in large part, on what happens in the advanced economies. Now, I think this is a case where um, using alternative scenarios can be very helpful. And this also related to the question about uh, what, should we still publish future policy paths. I would say don't publish one Publish several. So you say, here's if the, if the FOMC's modal projection is correct and everything else about the world economy goes the way that we expect, here's what we think would be the most likely path that the Bank of Korea would follow. Okay. But then you say, but of course, <laughs> other things could happen. One is that the markets are right and the Federal Reserve doesn't even lift off until much later in a much more shallow trajectory. That's probably because U.S. inflation is weaker and aggregate demand isn't as strong as we currently thought. Here's the implications for the Bank of Korea. And maybe a third scenario where, um, you know, the U.S. economy starts booming forward and interest rates actually have to be tightened more quickly. And those would be why this is, again, business practice. Identify plausible material risks and develop contingency plans and communicate those, explain those to your investors so your investors are still willing to leave you in charge. So um, this should be become standard practice for central banks. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to uh, our conclusion of this fourth session. Uh, I will uh, try to summarize this because uh, you all understand the basic argument. Uh, let me give a big applause to our presenters and discussants. Thank you. <laughs>